Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the Optics.org hosted webinar on optical filters in space, uh, presented by my friend here, Jason Paladois from Iridian Spectral Technologies. Jason joined uh, Iridian in, 20, in 2006 and has over 20 years of experience working with thin film optical filters. He's developed filter specifications together with Iridian's customers to optimize solutions for a wide range of technical and commercial needs in, in applications such as telecom, Raman spectroscopy, fluorescence mi uh, microscopy, 3D entertainment, and IR remote sensing. Recently, as a product uh, group manager for aerospace and specialty optics, his focus has been on optical filters for use in SATCOM, optical inter-satellite link filters, and solar rejection windows. Also, Earth observation, including multispectral filter arrays. Just Jason has an MSc in physics from McMaster University. At the end of Jason's presentation, there will be time for some Q&A. Um, but please don't wait until the end of the session before you start asking your questions. If there's anything that pops into your mind at all, put it in the chat box and we'll get through as many questions as we can at the end of the session. If we can't get through everybody's question, please don't worry, someone from the Iridian team will contact you directly. At the end of the webinar, we'll post some handy link, um, links uh, in the chat box in case you want to know more about some of the topics covered in today's presentation. Finally, if you want to enjoy the webinar again in your own time, then you'll be able to download the recording from the optics.org webinar page in the next few days. With that, Jason, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks very much, Rob. So I'll start sharing my screen here and uh, we'll talk a little bit about optical filters in space. So before I begin I'll, uh, uh, to talk about optical filters in space specifically, I'll t introduce you a little bit to uh, Iridian Spectral Technologies. So Iridian's been around uh, since 1998. We're a Canadian company and we have about um, 170 folks that are that are actively involved in the manufacture and, uh, and and production of these optical filters. All our manufacturing is done at the the building that you see in the image there uh, in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. We are an ISO 9001 2015 certified company since May of 2016, and we're also registered as part of the Canadian Controlled Goods Program. So fundamentally, Iridian, whoopsie daisy, sorry about that. Fundamentally, Iridian designs and manufactures thin film optical filters and coatings, uh, covering the wavelength range of about 300 nanometers out to recently uh, 15 microns in the long wave infrared. Most of our solutions are customized, um, built specifically to, to customer needs, and cover the range of different optical performance characteristics such as edge pass filters, notch filters, band pass, multi-band pass filters, as well as multi-zone uh, filter arrays with spatially varying spectral performance. The size of the filters we produce varies from so small, sub-millimeter size for uh, telecom fiber optic uh, applications, for example, up to as large as and larger than 150 millimeters in diameter for things such as astronomy or the solar rejection windows that I'll talk about later on. The technology we use to produce these optical filters is largely energetic sputtering. Um, we have over 20 chambers. <laughs> I put 20 plus because we're adding more all the time. Uh, the, uh, use energetic sputtering to manufacture optical filters, and we also have a, a added evaporation into our capabilities, which has allowed us to extend the wavelength range up to uh, 15 microns in the long wave infrared. These um, deposition chambers are all controlled by custom design and control software created at Iridium that creates the filter design and then controls and, and manufactures the filters themselves. The, fil uh, the pattern filters can be produced by um, in-house um, uh, uh, patterning in our in our photolithography lab. So the topic of the uh, webinar is optical filters in space and I'll begin by talking a little bit about the applications that the filters are used in before we get into the filters themselves. And the two applications I'm going to focus on are Earth observation and SATCOM. So one of the things that has really happened over the last last decade, but certainly over the last few years, is that there's been a fundamental change in the economics of launching satellites into space. Um, back in the, as you can see on the, on the chart in the 60s and 70s, you were looking at tens of thousands of dollars per kilogram of satellite 
to launch in a space. Whereas now, where we're approaching something more like $1,000 to $2,000 per kilogram to launch into space. And this has resulted in, in the, the, the graphic you see on the left, where the number of satellites has, has gone up uh, just phenomenally. We now have constellations of satellites rather than individual single satellite missions um, that are being sent up. And this, this, is, this has allowed commercial uh, entities to begin to participate in space. So it's not just a space agency um, driven phenomenon. Uh, here's an example of, of, of how that, uh, that economics has changed. This is uh, from the, the Tesla Hadi site, uh, the, the inside of the nose cone of one of SpaceX's launches, their Transporter 1. And this was a ride share. So rather than, than in the old days where you, you know, a space agency would, would dedicate a rocket launch to putting a satellite into space, the nose cone of this, this uh, transporter has dozens uh, of different satellites for different applications in them. At the bottom of the picture, you see stacks of Starlink um, SATCOM uh, satellites for SpaceX. But at the top of the nose cone, there are several different uh, satellites for different commercial entities there, including some of Planet's uh, SuperDove Earth observation um, satellites. So on this, this single mission, different commercial entities with different applications, really changing the, uh, the access to space, democratizing it, really. And that has created a photonic space race what historically was exclusively the domain of the space agencies, some of whom are listed there, has evolved into more of a commercial activity. There still are um, space agency involvement and folks like ISRO, uh, the Indian Space Agency, are, are actively involved in these, um, these shared launches where they, they've sent up satellites with 160 different, uh, uh, or uh, rockets with 160 different satellites on them. The commercial folks that are involved um, in, on Earth observation range from uh, companies like Planet and uh, Satellogic that are creating their own satellites and instrumentation and providing the data to the customers on the ground, but also companies like um, Samara or uh, Sat Revolution, Satlantis, uh, Surrey, uh, Space Technology Laboratories that are creating the instruments to be used in another um, customer's satellite. There's a, this is an incomplete list, but a wide variety of, of uh, and, and geographically wide variety of, of companies involved in Earth observation. On the SATCOM side of things, it's a smaller domain. It's newer, and these are large constellations of satellites providing internet from above. So there are really going to be a handful of different um, participants in this creating these constellation networks. I've listed a few here that are involved on the optical side. Telesat with their upcoming light speed project, which is expected to have 300 plus satellites involved in the constellation. Amazon's project Kuiper, which is expected to be about 2,500 different satellites in their constellation. And SpaceX with Starlink already has a number of satellites up there providing what they call a you know, better than nothing beta service. But eventually they, SpaceX is currently um, expecting to put up 30,000 satellites in this mesh network in low Earth orbit. So just, just incredible. Below that, I've listed a few of the companies that are involved in supplying uh, some of the instrumentation to the SATCOM um, uh, network providers. So these are, these are more the, the second tier below, companies like TSAT, uh, Mineric, Talus, et cetera, uh, that are creating the, the Honeywell, creating the, the instrumentation, the, the optical engines that go in these SATCOM satellites themselves. So that's a little overview of what's happened in, in uh, space and, and uh, the access to space for these, these applications. So now I'll talk specifically about Earth observation. So you, you can't manage what you don't measure um, is the synopsis of this quote you see on screen here. And that's a quote that's often wrongly attributed to Peter Drucker, who while I'm a massive fan of is, is actually not the source of it. It was H. James Harrington as this quote here and really how it relates to Earth observation is there's a lot of phenomena on, on Earth that we would like to better manage our environment, uh, economics, um, the, the uh, you know, climate, the uh, agriculture, etc. But you can't manage it if you can't measure it, you can't see it. And it's really hard to measure or, or something when you're in the system. So Earth observation provides the opportunity to gain a perspective from outside of the system, essentially above Earth, looking down at Earth and providing those, those concrete measurements that allow us to better manage our planet. That Earth observation data that's collected, um, which can be images or, 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 or anal analyzed data, 
uh, can be used in things like disaster response, um, the forest fires in Australia and Canada this, this summer, or flooding in Europe, where you can see the before and after on a daily basis, where it's happening and how, how uh, disaster response can go and address those needs, defense and, and business intelligence. I mentioned agriculture and forestry, where you can map fields or forests and, and see what's being done and what, what best um, uh, methods to use to address those, those industries, and environment and climate climate and weather monitoring to, to ensure that, that we're not more adversely affecting our planet with our activities. There's been a fundamental uh, evolution in Earth observation over the last uh, few decades. Really one of the first or the first uh, Earth observation satellite was put up in 1972 by NASA. And this is Landsat 1 shown here. Uh, this had four spectral bands, four different spectral bands, which is nice. You can see different spectra with 80 meter resolution, but it weighed a whopping 1800 kilograms. You can see the picture of it there. So that's one of these single launch, put the satellite up, and that would have cost at, at, at the launch cost per kilogram in those days, many tens of millions of dollars simply in the launch costs for Landsat 1. Sentinel-2 is, is what ESA has been doing over the last few years. And you can see the number of spectral bands has increased and the resolution has decreased substantially, but that's still a pretty large satellite. We move forward to SuperDove. So this is Planet Lab's uh, offering, uh, which has uh, eight different spectral bands, sub-meter resolution, and weighs a, a, a mere four kilograms. It's about, they're about the size of a loaf of bread. And so with the launch cost per kilogram, you're looking at the super doves be costing between five and $10,000 per satellite to launch something uh, compared to t several tens of millions of dollars that Landsat 1 would have cost. And that satellite provides far better resolution and, and far more spectral bands. So it's really changed uh, the, the information that can be provided from these satellites. And this, this is seen in this chart here, which is the number of spectral bands uh, that, and sensors that are operating in orbit um, over time. It, it, it has increased, and this, this data was from 2015, and it is, has increased further since, since then. So that's Earth observation as an application. Well, what about Earth observation optical filters? What we make at Iridium. So there are two aspects that I'll talk about. Single band filters, looking at a single wavelength, and multi-zone filter arrays. That are, that are creating multispectral imaging uh, capabilities in these satellites. So the, the, the uh, single band example that I'll look at is a, a filter we've done uh, and are doing for um, with Leonardo and Talus for um, ESA's Mediasat third generation lightning imager. So this satellite is intended to be imaging the earth and looking for um, lightning. And, in, and to do that, it's looking for the, the presence of a particular wavelength associated with an oxygen triplet line at 777.4 nanometers. So we're, we need a narrow filter to look at just that particular spectral line, but we also need a large optic because we can't look at a particular spot on Earth and look for lightning there. The satellite needs to look everywhere. So there's a large field of view requiring a very narrow filter, but also extreme uniformity of performance across that filter. So we've been able to produce um, a filter with very tightly targeted center wavelength to within plus or minus 10 picometers, but also maintaining that to within plus or minus 100 picometers over this large, uh, almost five inch diameter optic. And that's shown here in this uh, contour plot on the left, where those steps are 100 picometer steps. So over the entire optic, you're looking at you know 100 picometer difference across the, this 125 millimeter clear aperture of this part. The plot, <clears throat> the plot on the upper right, or what looks like a plot, is actually 69 different spectral measurements, 69 different plots at measurements uh, across that part. They just happen to all look like one because they're, it's, it's so uniform, they lie on top of each other. So that's a huge uh, challenge for an optical filter manufacturer, but it, it's necessary to deliver the performance needed for this type of application. A completely different application in, in Earth observation is multispectral imaging, looking at different science lines at different pixels on a sensor, so it leverages a, a detector to look at multiple uh, aspects at, a, at, a, at once. And this is what you see on with the uh, Planet Labs, for example, or Landsat with their four, their four bands. So here's an example um, of a, a multispectral filter uh, that we did almost a decade ago now for the Canadian Space Agency Space Technology Development Program. And you can see it next to our now defunct Canadian penny and in the fingers of my colleague uh, Claude Montcalm's gloved hands. And this, was, uh, uh, this has multiple bands. Each individual band 
uh, next to it, next to it, its other band, where the, each stripe on that is looking at a different spectral band shown in the, the, the plot on the bottom right in the mid and long wave infrared, looking at, at communication uh, and, and, and really weather bands um, uh, or weather phenomena. So different science lines of interest under each of those different uh, the spectral bands. There are different ways we can manufacture these, these um, filter arrays. One is a butcher block approach, as I showed on the previous slide, which is taking individual filters, cutting them up, and gluing them together. There's photolithographic patterning, where we take a single um, substrate and pattern, and then uh, pattern, uh, and then cover up, and then pattern neighboring bands on one substrate. And then there's combinations where we can do a photolithographic part and then glue them together to create a butcher block, or take a butcher block part and then photolithographically pattern, say, a black coating on top of it. Um, these assembled arrays approach, the butcher block approach, allows us to do really anything we can do on a single filter we can do as an array, because we can take individual filters, cut them into these bars, and then glue them together with these robust space-grade epoxies, uh, and then coat them with a black coating to cover the seams and, and, and uh, create this letterbox uh, view that you see on the middle picture on the right. The, the, these can have very complex coatings, uh, many, many bands, and can achieve zone-to-zone -zone transitions. I say less than 100 microns. That's really uh, pushing it. That's a very specific application, more like in the two to 300 microns between different spectral bands. So we've done up to 10, actually we've done in excess of 10 bands and can also do 2D arrays you see on the bottom right. Most of these are, are 1D linear arrays with many, many bands, each band looking at a different spectral um, science line of interest. With uh, photolithography, we can uh, shrink that get that band gap, that that's that physical gap between the bands, to on the order of, you know, 50 microns, um, and we can pattern any shape. With the butcher block, we really have to be assembling either bars or, or cubes into a, an array. With the, the patterning, we can pattern any shape. We could pattern the Iridian logo and have that be the uh, the the um, the pattern of of the science lines that 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 detector underneath sees. Additionally, we can get to different uh, sizes. As you see on the upper right, that, that optic there is, is about two by five millimeters uh, rectangular. So very small, um, much more detailed um, uh, and, and precise patterning as possible than you can do with an assembly. However, we're limited to the number of bands we can do because of compounding yields and, 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 uh, and the complexity of the filters that we can produce with this approach. So there are different pros and cons to the different approaches. Butcher blocks are good when you have a lot of bands. Patterned arrays are good when you need a specific uh, pattern or, or want to have a monolithic substrate. And we work carefully with our customers to customize the approach that meets their specific needs. So that's Earth Observation. Um, SATCOM is a completely different story. Um, at Earth Observation, we have satellites flying up above and looking down at Earth and observing it. In SATCOM, where the, our, the customers are putting up this network of satellites that are communicating with each other and then providing that, uh, that communication link down to Earth. So basically taking the Earth, the tr typical terrestrial telecom system, and moving it up into space. And this is not new. It's new the, the, what's being done now is new, the, the, the constellations that are coming. But back in this article is showing back in 1945, uh, an article by uh, the famous Arthur C. Clarke talking about extraterrestrial relays providing worldwide radio coverage. And this was realized in 1962 with Telstar 1, which provided television telephone signals from space. And they're talking broadband um, space, uh, signals provided uh, through RF or, or microwave frequencies. The SATCOM that we're talking about nowadays is addressing needs to, for remote and rural communities to have internet access, access to everyone, anytime, anywhere providing secure communication, providing uh, low latency communication to uh, enable the, the large requirements for data for Internet of Things. Imagine uh, remote uh, driving may need these, these, this communication, uh, autonomous driving would may, may need this communication to and from the Internet rapidly anywhere, anytime. And 5G pr pr um, adds a, an additional layer of, of, of data management needed. And, and low latency required. So all of this is driving this SATCOM market evolution. So why not just do what, what was envisioned in the, the Arthur C. Clarke uh, image there that, that, that historically had been done, these large satellites a long way from Earth, because that's great. 
you don't need very many satellites and you can see a large swath of Earth all at once. However, when you're 25 times farther away than you are in low Earth orbit, you have 50 times the, uh, the, the, the lag in your signal to get to and from the, those, those satellites. And, and that just isn't, isn't uh, viable uh, for the needs of the, the internet um, communications that they're trying to provide from SATCOM. So when you move down to LEO, to low Earth orbit on the order of 1,000 kilometers or less, um, you can get very low latency systems that are uh, similar speeds from say London to Singapore, as you see with uh, terrestrial fiber optic systems. However, now you can only see a very small part of Earth. You don't, you don't, you don't get to see very much. So you have to connect these satellites one to another to create this mesh architecture, creating this this constellation of satellites. Really, that wasn't uh, historically viable because of the what I talked about earlier, the economics of launch. When it's very expensive to launch, you couldn't think of having a constellation of satellites when each satellite you know, is you know, tens of thousands of, do or t of dollars per kilogram to launch. With the current uh, economics, this, this now makes sense. So what's the role of optical uh, in SATCOM? Um, the, the, the example I looked at before with Telstar 1 was, was radio frequencies. Well, optical provides larger modulation bandwidth than, than, than RF. Uh, narrower beam divergence and more secure communications. If you intercept an optical signal, you know you intercepted it because it's blocked. You can't you can't listen in on an optical signal. It's an unregulated spectrum, and you have smaller and lighter hardware, so it's more bits per watt per kilogram, which again lowers the cost per bit, essentially that you that you're able to communicate uh, even farther. And in addition to the ride sharing benefits discussed earlier, so all of this. Is, is creates this optical intersatellite link OISL, so links between the satellites that are that are done by laser communications optics. So, what role do optical filters play in that? Well, as just as in a, a terrestrial telecom system, these these laser communications, free space optics between the satellites, need filters to provide the wavelength division multiplexing functionality that you see on Earth to combine and split the signals through dichroic filters, to clean up the filters, uh, the signal through bandpass filters. A unique uh, need in space is to have windows on these satellites that, that re reject the solar background radiation, only let that signal band through. And as well, there are also filters needed for some of the secure communication methods, uh, like QKD, uh, which preserve polarization. The example shown here is a solar rejection window. You see the very lovely picture on the upper right. Uh, and the, the graph on the bottom right shows that this filter in orange transmits the telecom si signal band in the 1500 region, but has deep and broad blocking over the rest of the solar background, improving the signal to noise in the satellite and also reducing heating within the satellite by keeping the, the sunlight out. These filters have to be narrow and have uh, you know, deep and broad blocking but they're large and so that creates a high uniformity requirement and also makes a challenge with regards to transmitted wavefront error. The signal is going long distance in free space um, from satellite to satellite and we need to maintain that that eye diagram of that 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 that's just being essentially realized by these systems and so we need low wavefront error uh, distortion on these um, uh, induced by these filters and that's not just from the substrate itself. When you have a large filter like this, the coding contribution due to non-uniformities can actually start to dominate the, 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 the transmitted wavefront error. So it creates a real challenge from the filter manufacturer for the wavelength selectivity, uh, but and to achieve that low uh, transmitted wavefront error, extremely uh, good uniformity, similar to what we saw before with the, uh, the Earth observation lightning imager filter. So definite challenges here, but we've been able to, to overcome them for our, for our customers. The dichroic filters are what you would expect to see in a typical telecom system where maybe you have a band at 1545 and 1565 in this example. One of the bands is transmitted, the other band is reflected, splitting them off or combining them in wavelength division multiplexing. So the filters need to be as steep as possible uh, and with high transmission and high reflection so that we can get these signals packed as tightly as possible and perhaps put more signals into the system. These filters have to offer both low transmitted wavefront error and low reflected wavefront error because the reflected light is used as well. However, they are much smaller, so the uniformity requirements are not as, as severe typically as you see with the solar rejection filters. However, because they work at a non-zero angle of incidence, 
the the effects of angle on on the filter and, and that that effect on how how steep an edge we can create because of the angle shift associated with wavelength uh, can be a, a contribution something we need to work with the customers on in minimizing the um, the design uh, variation minimizing their angle tolerance in their design can make for a much better um, optical filter design bandpass filters would be correspond to the the bands that are that are being transmitted or reflected by those uh, dichroic filters and have similar requirements as you'd see with the dichroic filters with the exception that um, wave, reflected wavefront error is not important because these are just cleanup filters otherwise similar in terms of their their uh, complexity and the challenges that we have uh, in making them finally as i mentioned for um, quantum uh, key distribution uh, you're trying to uh, communicate a, a, a quantum signal and, and the security is basically established by ensuring that, that there's been no change in the signal um, as it goes from one end to the other. So people see, is there any change in the signal? Is anybody listening in on this? Well, we have to then make sure that the optical filters don't induce a change in state and that state is polarization. So in addition to all the regular requirements of the dichroic and, and bandpass filters, we also have to be concerned to make sure that the filters are preserving polarization so that they are not responsible for that change and, and that, that secure link can be established. Not really necessarily making a more complex filter to manufacture, but just adding one more design constraint when we make the filter to say, okay, we've made this, we can't vary this parameter. We, we have to hold that parameter fixed as well. Uh, that's the uh, the overview of Earth observation and SATCOM. And space heritage in general is something that Iridium has established over the last decade or so. In working in space, uh, there's a need to ensure that the materials are robust to solar radiation, that they can survive the, the rigors of launch, vibration, thermal shock, um, and as well as uh, minimize thermal uh, our, our outgassing and reliability uh, requirements as well. So this is something we've tested, or our customers have largely tested. But we've tested as well at Iridian. And, and again, you know, once we understand the use conditions, we can ensure that the filters will work in these in 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 space. And that's been demonstrated both at the single band filters and the multi band filter arrays. We we really don't have any issues here, and, and this has been well established with us and with our customers. Uh, we've worked with customers on these projects with partnering right from the start through to, to their volume production, which now actually exists with space. And previously, it, volume production was one. You don't only ever do one, one of a filter, but now with the SATCOM, we're, we're pr putting up constellations of these parts. We also have these product-focused production processes through the variety of things, uh, um, offerings that we address for our customers. We can create a production process customized to a specific need and learn. The telecom, terrestrial telecom filters that we make has benefited our, our SATCOM um, filters and vice versa. And we guarantee the performance of the filters that we make as well. Uh, lastly, we fundamentally are converting glass into finished goods through all these filter manufacturing processes that I've discussed as well as automated uh, visual inspection, uh, optical inspection, automated cleaning, uh, pick and place, environmental test equipment at Iridian, and a, a very um, uh, high performing in-house optics fabrication to polish uh, substrates and filters to, to meet these needs, especially when it comes to wafer and error, as well as to dice and core them into the final sizes necessary for the end customer's application. That's all I've got for today, and I'll, I'll then throw it back to, to Rob for, for questions uh, that may have come up. Um, you can visit us at uh, Iridian.ca, you can shoot me an email, connect with me on LinkedIn, you can try to phone me, although as you can see, I'm not working in the office uh, so much anymore, I'm a, a lot from home, but hope to hear from you and learn about your any questions you have about optical filters for space, or equivalently, optical filters for, for terrestrial applications. I'm happy to talk about those as well. Rob? Thanks, Jason. Um, a great insight as always. Um, I do. There's a few questions that have come in, um, and I, but I've got a couple of my own. If you don't mind uh, me asking, um, sure. you talked about um, the testing uh, uh, of the filters. You know, for those harsh uh, space environments. Can you go into a little bit more detail about sort of what that testing involves and sort of how you go about doing that? Sure. There's um, 
there are different things. There, there's there's thermal testing. Often we need to do to worry about thermal shock as as we're we're in space. You know, it's cold except when you're facing the sun. So at Iridian we have thermal um, um, shock chambers where we can cycle filters from you know high to low temperatures and ensure that the performance doesn't change, including the arrays. Uh, one of the tests we've done is 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 very violent. Uh, where we take the the assembled arrays and basically dip them from boiling water into liquid nitrogen and make sure that they, they don't fall apart uh, to start, but then also the spectral performance isn't affected by these changes. So there's there's the thermal shock, but also there's there's the radiation environment in, in space. There's solar radiation that we're all protected at mostly uh, from with the atmosphere. But the farther up you go, the less of that uh, that protective atmosphere that you've got. So we clearly don't have a radiation testing facility at Iridian, but there are lots of um, uh, companies that do. So we're able to take filters, we send them off to a, um, a radiation testing facility, they quite literally pop them in a bag, dunk them down into the uh, <laughs> radiation source, pull them up, and then we test them before and after to see if there's any change. And you do see change. You see change with uh, different glass types. Filter uh, BK7 as a glass type will be affected by solar radiation. So if, if a, a, a filter is used in an environment where it's going to see that radiation and where that, that matters, you don't want that change in performance, that browning or yellowing of the, of the substrate, you can choose alternate substrates like BK7G18 or fused silica. So by understanding the use conditions we, uh, and, and understanding how the, the materials actually are affected by use in space, we can then uh, choose the right, um, design the right solution for the customer. Oh, sorry, I'm mute, Rob. Oh, I was just trying to guarantee I didn't interrupt you. <laughs> um, it's so, only been a year and a half on Zoom, so I'm sure it's. Uh, I know, I know, I should know it by now. It's all new. <laughs> um, we do have a kind of good question which rolls on from that. So, um, what is the expected lifetime uh, of the optical filter, filter which is designed for the space application? Wow. Uh, not really any different than you'd see on Earth. We we you know we've we've done um, Telcordia uh, qualification for for um, the telecom systems for two decades. We've been making filters for you know terrestrial telecom systems, including use in like submarine components or putting them under the sea. They never want to get them again. Well, you never want to have to go get it from space either. Except um, a lot of the customers may they they will be deorbiting these systems in sort of the, the satcom in five to ten years. The lifetime of the filters is really uh, 20 plus years. It's it's we are, we are, we are not seeing any aging in in performance um, of the filters under the conditions that we've been required to to test. Them. Okay, um, and with things like materials, um, do you apply filters directly onto materials such as things like sapphire or anything like that? Uh, we sapphire is a, a a substrate material that we do coat on. Um, we typically don't code on customer supplied optics. So if somebody says, here's, you know, I have this lens that I want to use in my system. Can you put the filter on that? Sometimes, but usually not because th that creates real complexity in trying to monitor and measure the performance through that. And the curvature of parts can make it more difficult. So we're usually coding on flat substrates and then cutting them to, to size at the end. Those substrates can be glasses like BK7, BK7G18, fused silica. Silicon is a substrate that we use in a lot of our, our terrestrial telecom, not, not often in space, but it can be. It, it's high thermal drift, but absolutely sapphire is, is a, a, a material we can use. Um, depends on, again, why, why folks would want it. We, we've, we've coded on sapphire for some space-based applications. What, what the benefit is, it's more expensive material, more harder, um, harder to cut and process a little bit than other glasses, but we're happy coding on virtually any glass Plastics, though, um, we, we've done some work there and tried that, and um, uh, thank you, no. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have a few more questions here, if that's all right. Um, we've got a little bit of time. Um, do you also make linear variable filters? Uh, not very often. We, we've, we've done some from time to time. Uh, we it, uh, When those requests first came in, uh, to be honest, it was, it, it was, it's sort of this massive irritation because we spent all this time making things so uniform and not varying over the filter. And then somebody comes to us and says, well, can you make it varying? Like, oh, 
we've spent all this time making it so so it's it's all about controlled uniformity and we can control the uniformity to a certain extent and and create some linear variable uh, uh, linear variation or variation across the part but if folks are looking for a more standard um, linear variable filter in, in the divisible wavelength range um, something with a, a lot of variation over a small wavelength area it's something we may be able to do we don't do a lot of it there are other folks for whom that is their specialty so they're probably best uh, best going to them excellent okay um there's another question here just uh, sort of um referring back to um the butcher's block approach mm -hmm. um why do you glue instead of op optically contact oh yeah uh, so yeah so we we do optical contacting in a number of our builds if we're building say some prisms where we have a, a, a really large and flat optical surface and it's coated and they have to be really really perfectly polished and flat contact together and you can create a, a say a prism cube where you have an optical contact at that at that seam in the center in this case we are taking thin glass half millimeter to millimeter thick glass cutting them into bars sure. look at how lucky we are uh so <laughs> cutting them into bars and then gluing them together um, uh, on edge. The edges, you're, you're talking about the edge of a half millimeter to a millimeter thick piece of glass that has been diced and cut along. So you're not gonna have, unless you then went and somehow polished that edge perfectly flat, maybe, but you don't have much area, really difficult to get a, a, a good enough polish to optically contact. The other question would then be, I'd throw it back and say, well, why would I optically contact? What would be the advantage of optical contacting versus epoxy? With epoxy, I I can control my my gap size. We have you know spacer beads, so we know how wide that gap is, and we create and the the uh, uh, outgassing is not an issue with the, the epoxies that we use meets all the 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 requirements for space, but also the robustness when we're done. So we've created these these arrays and we've done the testing where we've we've built 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 the filters into these arrays and then break test them. So you take them and, and we take an anvil and we push on one of the bars and, and see, you know, how strong is this filter before it breaks? Well, they break in the glass. They don't break in the epoxy joint. The epoxy joint winds up being stronger than the glass substrate itself. So in terms of robustness, the epoxy is, is more than sufficient. And yeah, it's just optical contacting wouldn't, wouldn't be viable, but also I don't know uh, what advantage it would provide. Okay. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, uh, what do you see as the future of optical ground to satellite and satellite to satellite communications? Sure. Um, the SATCOM, so what I've talked a lot about is, is OISL, optical inter-satellite links. That's satellite to satellite communication optically. And that makes a lot of sense because you're, you're up in, in orbit, you have no clouds, no atmosphere, nothing between the satellites. You have a nice, clear, free space optical path. Why wouldn't you use optical in satellite to satellite? Uh, I mentioned the, the, the advantages, uh, lo lower power, lower weight, higher throughput, everything says optical is better satellite to satellite. It's a little bit more of a challenge, a little bit different story when you're talking about sat to ground. It, all those advantages are still there, but now you're going through the atmosphere. I mean, is it cloudy? Uh, you know, optical has more of a problem with clouds than RF or microwave. So, so there are some systems which are going to be OISL off above and then radio frequency sat to ground. But there are also ground to sat um, optical systems that are being set up where there's redundancy, different stations around, so you can avoid bad weather. Could because you still do have the advantages of of the the bandwidth that you can that you can get versus um, uh, radio. So. There, there are optical ground stations, optical ground to, to sat, optical is necessary for the quantum key distribution approach. So there are, are places where optical is needed, but I think there's, there will likely in the future be a hybrid system where we have this optical mesh network, some optical sat to ground, ground to sat, and also uh, radio frequency uh, sat to ground, ground to sat. Okay. Well, I think we've got uh, maybe just one or two more questions, if that's all right. Um, mm -hmm. One I'm going to chuck into the mix, um, bearing in mind, obviously, where a lot of us are working from home due to sort of restrictions from the pandemic. Have you seen this affect kind of the way that you guys have had to work and operate as a consequence of, you know, customers not necessarily being 
in the office or you you know um sort of how you guys had to operate to sure that's an interesting question um so iridian has been open throughout um you know a lot of what we do is deemed uh, essential of uh, the telecommunication systems filters that we're doing for uh, COVID testing instrumentation. So we have been manufacturing, the manufacturing floor has been running throughout the uh, the pandemic. Of course, with different work conditions at work in terms of spacing and, and safety for, for the folks that, that are in the office. Folks like me that don't actually do anything can work from home and, and that's fine. And so we've been doing a lot of that, you know, who, who can be at home will be at home. In terms of interacting with the customers, most of our customers, well, we have, we have a wide variety of customers. We have folks in telecommunications, that's been busy. Biomed, as I mentioned, has been very busy. The space stuff has still been going. We have a large uh, business in 3D uh, cinema and theme park glasses. That's been dead last year because nobody's been able to go to movies or go to theme parks. So different parts of the uh, the business have, have adjusted to the, the pandemic differently. But in terms of the interaction with customers, as we're doing here, you know, I joked if it's, it's been a year and a half, but we're, we're all pretty used to it. And, and frankly, I actually see more of my customers, see uh, virtually at least more of my customers than I ever did before. This all existed before the pandemic. We just didn't use it. That we're all forced to use it. I think we've all learned uh, that there are some advantages and, and we can interact this way. It'll be great to get back to travel and uh, see folks at you know, live at uh, in their offices or have uh, whiskey and meatballs with you at Photonics West in uh, in <laughs> January. But uh, in the interim, there, there there are we've been able to operate really uh, business as usual uh, and and interact with our customers um, in a, in a, in a semi normal operation. Excellent. So it's not really um, had any adverse effect, per se. You know, it's actually been quite a, quite a positive experience, I suppose. Well, yeah, it, it's it's. Yeah, don't get me wrong. The the, the you know the, <laughs> we have we have we we're taking safety measures at work, and it's important to to maintain those safety measures and to try to try to you know to to keep all the employees, the folks that have to go into the office. So me not going in is is not just better for me; it's better for them. I don't expose them to me. Uh, so so it's you know uh, it's not. Certainly, I wouldn't say it's been a, a positive, but but what can come out of this is I believe that when when everything's said and done, we don't need to go back to the good old days. We can take we can take what we've learned over the last year and a half and apply it to the to the to the new better days. So we can we can take the way things were, but then add some of this ability to better communicate with each other more easily and more frequently on top of that. So we can wind up in a better state at the end than we were going into the pandemic. I hope. No, for sure. I think we all agree on that one. Um, as a more general question, um, rather than in space, how do you make sure of the optical performance of your designs? Is there a literature based validation or just characterize design uh, on software and measure? Yeah, no, we have. Uh, so the, the, the custom design and control software that I talked about uh, does a lot of that, the analysis. So before we ever make a filter, you know, it's been designed and there's you know, theoretical analysis based on optical constants that says this is how this design will perform when it's, manu when, when it's manufactured. However, when you manufacture it, you never put down exactly the layer of thicknesses it, it, you know, it, it, on each layer as, as by the design. So as we're coding, we're taking measurements, in situ optical measurements, on each layer as it's deposited and saying okay at this point in the design after this many layers the, the spectral shape should look like this and it looks like that great or it takes a measurement and says oh i'm starting to deviate and the software automatically says okay on the next layer i'll make it a little thicker or a little thinner to compensate for that offset so as the coating is being manufactured the equipment is measuring and adjusting to get as close to that target performance as possible fine you finish you wind up with your pieces of glass now we then take them and individually characterize them. We do spectral measurements with these spectrophotometers, optical spectrum analyzers, different you know, measurement um, um, techniques uh, out on the filter and along the filter to see that, that uniformity variation. So when we ship to customers, we have the theoretical data, but we also have measured performance at usually multiple spots on each filter that the customer receives to demonstrate that the actually actual delivered performance meets the specifications that we've quoted. Okay, um, we probably have time for two more questions, if that's all right, um, without exhausting you. Okay. Um, so, um, do you think 
SATCOM, uh, will SATCOM replace Earth-based fiber optic uh, wireless telecom systems? No, 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 there, there, there will still be the, the fiber optic backbone down here. There's no way SATCOM is taking over everything. Uh, but what SATCOM will do is it will it will provi provide access. Uh, Telesat's light speed is is has no intention of trying to compete with you know whatever your 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 local internet service provider. Telecom uh, Telesat's light speed is intended to be providing uh, high security communications to businesses and and you know specific commercial entities. So so a very specific group that wants a specific uh, has a specific need <clears throat> that can be delivered by that SATCOM system. Starlink is a little bit different. Starlink is trying to be a little bit more competitive with with the terrestrial system, but I don't think Elon would claim that that Starlink is going to replace um, you know all of the the different terrestrial systems. It is providing broad access. It is providing remote and rural access. It is provide it'll provide access. You're in a plane, you can get it. You're on a boat, you can get it. You're at the cottage, you can get it. One of the things we've learned with this work from home is that you don't need to be necessarily in a big city uh, and so if you can go out in, in, in to your cottage or your 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 rural community and still get decent uh, high speed internet access then it 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 creates a, a more um, an ability to work anywhere so so i don't think it's 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 not one or the other there, there will still be the the mesh network down below supplemented with the uh the the, the network up above okay well that will bring me on to my final question then Okay. which is what do you see as the future for optical ground to satellite and satellite to satellite communications the future well again the fu the future is 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 we're going to see like spacex has i don't know a few hundred starlink satellites up there right now much to the chagrin of all the astronomers the astronomers have got a nightmare coming to them because the, the, it, you know that's a few hundred the SpaceX has said, you know, 2022 to 2024, that few hundred turns into 4,500, and then eventually to 30,000 satellites. So there, the, the, we we are just at the at the the start of the the satcom explosion in terms of of the number of satellites out there and the number of of providers. There will be a few winners, I think. You know, Starlink's out there, Amazon Kuiper, OneWeb has a, a system up there doing RF, uh, Telesat Lightspeed. So there will be a handful that wind up. Uh, developing but over the next five to ten years i think there'll be much more well there'll be much more access right now you can buy St uh, starlink uh, uh, receiver the satellite set it up and you can be getting depending on where you live in the world you can be getting internet via starlink now that will just become more and more ubiquitous more and more accessible more and more competitive and may create more competition from the terrestrial folks as well in terms of what they're offering i i know even in like ottawa is it's and it's a million person city but there you know I, i've got friends that are just outside the the perimeter of the city here in in ottawa canada and they they have no access to to wired services the wireless um services that they have access to or these these towers and you know if you have if you can sort of see it from your your you put a, an antenna up it's really dodgy and that's i'm talking you know 10 kilometers away from my house here in 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 the middle of ottawa so the ability to for, for folks to access that anywhere anytime uh, that's there there is value in that and 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 clearly these companies see that and and so there there is there is going to be an explosion in 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 these systems and 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 the demand for them okay thanks very much i think that pretty much wraps up all of the questions that we've had coming in through um, if we haven't got through uh, all of your questions uh, that you've posted, uh, as I mentioned at the start, someone from Iridium will be getting back to everybody uh, over the next few days. Um, if you've enjoyed this presentation and want to watch it again, uh, then you'll be able to download it directly from the optics.org website uh, in the, within the next few days. Uh, and likewise, uh, I'm sure that uh, Jason will make sure that there's a, a copy available to download from the Iridium website as well. Um, I look forward to, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Jason uh, for putting on such an excellent presentation. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us again. Um, and I very much hope that you will be joining us in the not too distant future for some upcoming webinars uh, on whatever they may be. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time, everybody.